we are scattering ourselves throughout the land and then we isolate ourselves and we are dismissing the notion of the city practically. We are generating what I call a planetary hermitage, which means that we are separating ourselves from each other in a small nucleus in a contention that now we have the technology for communication and for information that doesn't require the presence of, of people, and that's catastrophic. Akrozani was a consequence of a, of a number of years that I, I've been doodling with the notion of, of the urban condition. I came from an Italian city, and when I got here, I was surprised by this uh, emphasis on abandoning the city. So there is a long tradition in Europe and in other continents about the development from the tribal into the metropolitan. It's called civilization. So civilizing means uh, urbanizing. We need to come up with laboratories, urban laboratories, because the problem is enormous. It's one of the most complex things because it, it, it deals with the, with the life of people. Paul Slary, he was a student of Frank Lloyd Wright and was at Taliesin for a number of years. And he was inspired by, you know, a new American concept for a city. It started as like a construction um, workshop where he, you know, would take on interns and volunteers who were interested in his style of architecture and method of concrete casting, which is called silk casting, where he uses like these natural forms made out of silt from the land around here. And you get this really interesting kind of texture for the concrete. Really kind of frugal building method where you just use dirt as your form. It's concrete cast in, in earth basically, which is uh, something he pioneered. I know you worked early on with Frank Lloyd Wright. Were you influenced at all by him and some of your ideas? Oh, it was a great experience because he was a great architect and uh, quite a guy. And he was able to insert our presence in a very elegant way, in a very nice way in the landscape. But in terms of, of developing a civilization, I think that was a total failure. Definitely started from um, at Taliesin, the idea of organic architecture, and he just took that concept and applied it not to just a single building, but to uh, a city. So these are the vaults, and to us, this is mainly like a big town square area. We come in and have various meetings and things like that. Because they're oriented to the south, you get the apse effect going on in this area. So you can see here during the summer months, we have a shade line coming down here, and that keeps this whole area shade cooled. Then during the winter months, the sunlight would be coming in here and warming up everybody who's in here. Before getting the, the roofing material for that with the metal order. I don't particularly like big city living. I grew up in Detroit and uh, just didn't like it too congested, too dirty. I hate New York City. As I put it, I didn't necessarily move from something, but just to something, because I just really like the idea of the philosophy actually resulting in an action. So here we have olive trees and uh, fig trees, and so they provide shade across the site. But also, again, like you said, the agricultural production. So the shade helps keep the sun off of you, helps cool off the concrete, and helps also keep the air cool. Over here, we have an apse. An apse is one quarter of a sphere. If you took a sphere and cut it into four sections and pulled one of them off, you'd have an apse. So you take this apse and you orient it to the south. Then during the winter months, the sun's low in the sky, and the sunlight goes directly into that apse area. And anyone working in there has a direct sunlight on them, plus it heats up all of that concrete. Then when the concrete gets warm, it radiates the heat back out, and then because of that app shape, it the, stops the wind from blowing that warm air away. So it's what you call a microenvironment. Then you can see during the summer months, there's a shade line across the front there, because the sun's higher up in the sky. So that provides shade cooling for that uh, interior apse. So just by its design and how it interacts with the sun, this apse heats and cools itself off with zero energy use.
Paulo Soleri. His intent here is to test his ideas of this new form of city making with its density and proximity to nature. The property area is about 4,400 acres. It's a really large piece of property. But the final plan for Arcasani, the full extent of it, the Arco 5000, so for a population of about 5,000 people, would only take up about 15 acres of land. So not much larger than what's already here. Basically, if, when this place grows, it will go up, not out. So we have thousands of acres around us and it'd be left open. You have immediate access to it no matter where you are. Can you define for me arcology? Just an architecture and ecology. It's architecture which is a shelter, habitat that recognizes the fact that it belongs to a landscape, which happens the sustaining system that makes our life possible. So instead of ignoring it or, or cutting yourself off it, you try to bring it in, but in ways which are human and non natural. Naturally, we don't, have, we don't have roads or streets now because we are very small, because the notion is that you want not to have the car on your back, don't build streets. Here we're more part of an urban experiment. So the idea of an archaeology means architecture and ecology, so a mix of both in a city. Go by the front door. Together where you preserve the environment by densifying the urban development. You dense enough so you, instead of spraying out like the suburb, because things are so dense, if you can walk or take your bicycle. Aha! There he is! Doing what are this. you doing? I have to do this. You have to do that? I never... Working hard? Hmm. Yeah? Setting a choo-choo train? No. No? I was studying uh, pre-law political philosophy in school and happened upon Tulare's book and uh, had learned about Arcosani. And I thought, well, I've had enough of books. And everybody sort of says the same thing with not really accomplishing anything. So here's somebody who's actually trying to do something uh, more on a you know physical level, actually making something. And well, some of the things that he develops is using the sun energy as much as possible, and to warm up in the winter and or. Um, doing some shading in the summer, so really playing with uh, the passive solar way of, of um, cooling and heating. And then also using cross ventilation as possible in the building so that you don't need as much air conditioning and that sort of thing. Shading as much as possible, shading in the summer and opening up in the winter or using the greenhouse effect in the winter. Uh, also integrating greenhouses in the design of the city so that you can grow your food. Now we're experimenting with the, what we call the heat duct tunnel and so hot hair from the greenhouses would be channeled up in the heat duct tunnel under a three-story housing complex and so the heat would be redistributed to heat up some of that housing. Also there's the idea of recycling the water into the arcology so it would be a lot easier to do inside a building or a three-dimensional city as opposed to a two-dimensional city.
the idea that you're densifying the space and conserving the land around to remain a natural environment. And that's the bit, one of the, probably the biggest problem with cities is that they spread out and destroy all the animals and natural environment and people living in those cities never get to see wild animals. That's why this place is just so great for me. I can, I can, we can do all these things with people, but we can walk out across or at least even look at it, you know, which is a real privilege, but to be able to walk out Take half a, a mile or a mile and be somewhere where there's never been any people, it's, it's amazing. We have this fact that you might work and live in what eventually can be a town, but you're looking out and you have a nature at your disposal. So this separation but connection between the urban and let's call it the farming or the wilderness or whatever, that's essential. As you can see, like our farmlands here and we've built the city up there on the rocks. Because there's a construction site up there and it's all concrete and it's very hectic. And down here gives people a little bit of a chance to escape and get off of the concrete and be around plants. The gardens here at Arco Santi, we're trying to come up with a design for riparian desert conditions where people can grow their foods in these environments and do it as low cost as possible. It can be very harsh and very challenging. So we're doing different things to try and really experiment and really push the envelope with that. And one of the things is the use of the polonia tree. It's the fastest growing hardwood in the world. To give you an example of, of how fast it is growing, these trees are three years old. Last year they were cut down to the ground and this is just last year's growth and this summer's growth on the top there, they just kind of have started to bush out. We're looking at them as a living shade canopy. Within 10 years, these trees can get to be about that big around and 75, 80 feet tall. So it allows us to expand our vegetable portfolio. But also, we're looking at it as a timber product and a way to help support the community and support the agriculture system. It's a challenge. It's a really big challenge here. August is probably our hardest month, and if it's not if it's not the bugs and the heat, <laughs> it's not raining. Um, so it's really difficult and it really challenges me to really think about things in a scientific way rather than just be like, well, I'll do this here because I've seen other people do that. There's a lot of things that haven't been done here in central Arizona. This is our planting of dry corn. We've been working with a Hopi elder named Morgan Sofke. We grow the dry corn, we flood irrigate it. It's planted much differently than your regular sweet corn. Um, it's planted in groups of eight, and it grows up like a little bush. This grain that's growing out here is a cover crop. It's rye that we planted last fall, and we're using it to add organic matter into the soil and also to, to strangle out weeds. I feel really strongly the arcology theory and the idea of this density it's really a chance for us to be able to live a little bit better. How good is it to really live isolated in a little home, spread out in an ocean of other little homes, when you can have culture and live together and be in a city, up, not out? There's no reason why we have to have little suburban or big suburban homes with our own private everything when those things can be shared and we can live closer together. This is my community service. I live in the house next to the sweet hero. So when I moved up here, I said, I will plant a garden. What brought you here? A need to, uh, to be attached to something larger than myself. Certainly I feel protected and loved here. I'm the oldest woman here, of course. The only person here older than me is Paolo. 
But the larger thing is to change the way cities work and get people out of the suburbs and leave the land to do what it must do to nourish us all. And how many communities, about 100 people, have an amphitheater and a performance center, a music center, you know, all these things. It's an amphitheater. You're, this is public as it gets with this large kind of pedestrian pathway. All these lower level doors you see here are intended to be like storefronts. So this would be like a commercial space on the ground floor. And then up above you have multi-person apartments. And at the very top you have single apartments. So in a span of about 80 feet, you have the center of the stage and you transition all the way up to, you know, entirely private spaces where you have your own little nook. We like are right here on this kind of continuum of social spheres. What Paulo called the urban effect, and what he sees is the driving force behind cities is a really unique kind of diverse diversity that you don't find many places. From his perspective, architecture can somehow contribute to solving societal problems. The way the, the spaces are, are dealt with in terms of multi-use of the spaces, having a, a workplace right below this space, and most of the spaces that you walk to around here have entertainment spaces, workspaces, and living spaces all mixed in. All the, the spaces become more interesting to people. They're used 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yeah, I work in the foundry. We make bronze bells. The sale of bronze and ceramic bells is pretty much what finances the project here, so. If you showed this idea to someone that was living in the suburbs, they would think, oh, what do I have to give up to, you know, to live in this kind of situation? You know, I want my house in my yard, and even though I have to commute three hours every day, you know. You know, it's, it's close quarters, it's compacted, but it's not that much different from living downtown in a larger, older city, you know, so. We all know when we go to a nice design city, you know, like uh, New York or San Francisco, or if I take Montreal as an example. So you can only use a pass going down there, okay? Yeah. Those are all nice cities where they have enough of a dense city and a center where it's interesting and there's a lot going on, and that's, that urban effect really is really like important. This is spatially like an ecosystem. The more complex things get, the smaller they get. Look at the human brain. It starts as a couple cells, but then it gets turned into this completely complex and crazy convoluted matrix of things. And what we're trying to show here is that the same thing can happen with cities. As it grows complex, it has to be highly interlinked and three-dimensional to like be most efficient. Yeah, this is the lab building. So these were intended to be like artist studios, little like loft apartments above. And like all our spaces are pretty much naturally lit. So we put up like whitewash all over the windows during summer to kind of allow the light in, but not all of it. Keep things cool. And then by winter, we kind of, it kind of gets washed off with the monsoon rains. And then you get the full sun in winter, so it heats the space. This is like hundreds of years old technology, whitewash. That's a good example of the consciousness of the environment around us and the resource we have in terms of like sunlight. This is the Solari Office of Design. Like all the structures here, they're multi-use. We're actually underneath the CEO of the Kosani Foundation. That's his apartment right up there. So his commute is actually down that ladder you see over here. Oh, that's hilarious. And so you have all these different functions going on in the same building. It's just that it's more difficult. It's, yeah, it's, 
right. kind of. Yeah. Especially and when you do curves like that. Yeah. Paolo yeah. talks about the urban effect, which is just what, and it only happens in the city, you know, and the size of, you know, he's, he calls it the critical mass, which is 5,000 to 10,000 people. That's when the urban effect happens because it gives enough people so that this interaction happens. And it's really incredible in most places, very different cultures. Um, when you densify spaces, you have more public, mixture of public and private spaces. And here, that's one of the things that we all go through a process of learning, is how those public spaces are maintained. There's not a city government to maintain those. We all have to deal with that. We don't just say, oh, the city will take care of cleaning up the park. Lost and found, things like that. And another one. Can I have a tent meeting after this? We'll thought it's postponed until Friday. Come talk to me during the evening. Dealing with the, the idea of what's called the tragedy of the commons, an age-old problem. And that's one of the things that the architecture here is addressing directly. Whoa, hello birds. So we like these forms, these are called apses, they're like half domes. You take that fourth wall off the building and you have this totally different experience. You work outside kind of, but you're in shelter. So you have this connection with all sorts of things that go on, people walking by, nature. Paul Slay was influenced by Teilhard de Jardin, who is a philosopher, and what Paul took away from it is that as things get more involved, the, the more involved things get, the more complex and dense and miniaturized they get. That's an analogy for an arcology and how cities should function, being three-dimensional, highly cross-linked, Minimizing the amount of space that information needs to transverse in order to have a more efficient way of functioning. So my commute, and just like everyone else here, is not more than five minutes. This is a, a four-person apartment. We have a shared kitchen and bathroom. Dishwasher. Okay. The lavender cookies? So it turns out we walked in right in the middle of dinner. <laughs> Yeah, that's like Super Bowl party food. No, nachos? So this is one of the shared living areas, and then kind of get a... So this is, this is my room. It's kind of more like a dorm kind of environment. Pretty kind of improvised furniture. I mean, this is basically, uh, this, is all this, this is all my stuff. So you have, you know, your own space when you want it. Yeah, I don't spend a lot of time here. Most of my time I spend more communal areas with everyone else and you know, interacting with people. Yeah. What's uh, different here than what an intentional community is that it's very diverse. There's not one philosophical idea, there's not one religious idea, it's so you, it draws all types of people and you've got all types of personalities here. Yeah, I think this is much more uh, you know, I'm a web designer. I pay about minimum wage here, so, but the rent is low and the cost of living is low, so you end up doing all right. I think that's a really good idea. Because in some ways, um, kids also like the futuristic aspect, yeah. you know, the spaceship, right. the, you know, the jet or whatever. And then so if you're aligning the, the design with like a futuristic thing, that's good too. And right. People come here and the work is focused on construction and bell making, but then they really, I think what really happens is they start feeling included, they start feeling like they can be themselves, they start uh, pursuing what arts they're into, and suddenly it's like they start to relax. It's small, you don't, you don't want to make it too nice. small. Oh, I think this is nice too with the... Uh... Yeah, it was a little bit to the guy. It's amazing. I've seen this happen over and over, and it's like there's something really special here because of that. And people feel really, they start becoming themselves and relaxing, and it's it's amazing. Okay, you did. Oh, you get filmed. Oh, what's happening here? The idea is that the notion of gathering of people is fundamental for the development of the people themselves. Did he show you that? No. Yeah. 
But the main industry would be what I call the industry of the mind, which means try to learn about yourself and to learn about uh, what made for what we are now through an evolution of about three millions of years. So that's a, that's a task which is very demanding, very complex, but it's worth trying. You know, some of the things I was playing with, but then... Oh, that's nice. Oh, I think this is nice too with the... Uh... Yeah, it was a little bit to do some things. The real worth of what we are and what we do is not in the, in the shopping center. It's not. Well, I call this the, the bubble diagram. It's a device that reminds us that where we belong. So there is, a, there is a, a, the smallest bubble, which is the political correctness bubble what we think we have to do to be good citizens. Then there is the historical bubble, which is more oriented toward fitting ourselves in the historical landscape. Then there is the next bubble containing the other two, which is the, the evolutionary bubble. That's what uh, we come from. And, uh, and then the last bubble is the cosmic bubble, which is where we come from and where we are going to. So now and then it would be good to have an, a perspective that uh, doesn't look only at the, at the immediate present, but tries to understand wh where that present came from, and then and you keep going, moving toward the, the larger and larger containers. And that might help you to understand that what you think is very right here, might be very wrong there, might be senseless here, and might be no nonsense here. Arcosanti is an attempt to, to start from zero in a way because you're, you're prototyping. I started with the notion of 3,000, now we are up as a notion of 5,000. So it would, would, not, would be a very small town. We would like to have Arcosanti as a, as a sample, uh, something that you can experience. Keeping in mind that it was built without money and without professionals. I always compare it to the first whatever washing machine or the first typewriter or the first motorcycle or whatever. Usually the pro the first thing doesn't work. No, no. They you have to do it again and again. That's why you need laboratories where you accept the notion of failure. Maybe the, this idea of archaeology, the hope is that archaeologies will happen other places. Things will happen that make, will make people change this idea of the American dream. And the idea of archaeology is more than just a project or a city. It's, it's this idea and it's a symbol of something, you know, some kind of hope. He's the first little boy that's ever grown up in an archaeology. And for us, you know, that's really exciting. Because it's the kids, the next generation, the young people who are going to keep this idea going and develop it beyond anything we can come up with right now, you know. From the very beginning, with the appearance of consciousness, we became aware that we can do things and we have those instruments, fantastic instrument that allows you to do that. So transformation is very much what life is. I call it the becoming. For a long time we have been moving in directions which might not be the best direction. I'm pessimistic in the short run. I'm very optimistic in the long run. Let's get a we have been through a very long phases of success in success, the great achievements, horrendous uh, tragedies and so on. But we know that things are altering themselves because that's what the living reality is. So the question is how can we make the little, next little step that might be more promising than the, than the last. Paulo Slay passed away last year. Now it's like he was the guy. He made all the decisions and decided what route to take. And 
now we're trying to figure out, well, now it's up to us. What do we want to do? How do we want to do it? We're trying to figure all that out and we're relying on our large network of people who've come through here in the last 40 years. I think over 7,000 people have come and done a workshop here. Do you feel like people need to give up more in order to... Well, I don't call it giving up. I tend to call it free, freeing up. But that doesn't mean that you have to buy into the notion of uh, survival or uh, giving up this and this and this and that. It's just come up with, uh, with more lean notions about what you might enjoy and what you might want to do. Because the, the virtue of leanness eventually is worthiness, you know, streamlining what life might be.